was with Zangpo and uh, Aloha. <laughs> uh, greetings from Timpu, where we are having the morning of the full moon day of the second month. Uh, Venerable Lekshela, it's a great honor to have you uh, on this forum. Before we start, uh, can I ask uh, you and the online audience to spend a few moments to bring our awareness to here and now and cultivate the altruistic intention. Thank you. So we created this space last year uh, with the hope of uh, having conversations uh, and exchanges of insights and experiences on Buddha nature and related topics. And uh, in doing so, we are also hoping this whole culture of um, mindful listening and right speech and a wholesome exploration of meaning and purpose in human life and, and the core sort of message we want to relay out there is really that there is this very deep inner goodness in humanity. And I think this message has become very critical in our times, uh, particularly since last year with people going through a lot of stress from COVID and that stress leading to self-hatred and depression and a lot of mental issues. So uh, it's wonderful to have you here talk about this to share your insights because you have this incredible background and experience, uh, especially when you look at your CV, uh, you have done so much work in social justice and then also on death. And we sort of think that Buddha nature has a lot of relevance to both these topics, these areas. Um, but as a ritual, um, I always ask, our guest first to share with us uh, your first sort of experience of hearing the teachings on Buddha nature. If you can recall the moment or the time you heard this, where, when, and what kind of impression it had on you. And through this, of course, we would like to understand the, the background you come from and your own sort of journey, your spiritual evolution, um, that the audience would like to know you a bit more. So uh, venerable, when did you first hear about Buddha nature? <laughs> My story is a little bit unusual because my family name was Zen, spelled Z-E-N-N, -N, but it sounds like Zen Buddhism. So when the children started to tease me about being a Buddhist, I had to find out something about it. And I went to the library and read books on Buddhism. The one that um, introduced me to Buddha nature was Zen Buddhism by D.T. Suzuki. And um, I remember it distinctly because that and... The Way of Zen by Alan Watts. These were the only two books I could find. And they really opened my mind and I became so fascinated by Buddhist philosophy. So that was my first introduction from, from that time on. Yeah. So um, I, I'm not sure how he presented the theory of Buddha nature, but I know that it impressed me that all beings have the potential to become awakened. Mm. And then as you pursued uh, Buddhist education, well, before even we get to that, what do you think about your um, name being Zen? Uh, do you think there is some kind of karmic uh, reason to it? Because that was the trigger to lead you to Buddhism in a way. Right. Yes, I think it must be some kind of birthright. I mean, it can't be a complete accident, can it? Where I think we're one of the few families in the United States that have this name. And it was definitely misspelled at immigration because I found the passport. So it's very curious, but very fortunate for me because it led me directly to the Dharma. So I feel very, very lucky. As a child, I had all these questions about what happens to us after we die and I couldn't get any clear answers. So that's why I traveled to Asia at a young age. I was grew up surfing, you know, in Malibu, and um, it was it was great. It's almost a spiritual experience to be out in the ocean, you know, surfing. Um, and but and then when I went to Japan uh, to surf because the beaches were getting crowded, then it's when it started to snow. I went to a 
the monastery and started sitting zazen. So that was really my first introduction to Buddhist practice. I was 19, I think. So I was very fortunate in that way. Um, so it's incredible when, uh, especially for the Himalayan audience here, I'm quite sure that a lot of young Bhutanese are tuning in to listen to you. Uh, you had a fantastic, uh, really exciting spiritual journey, I would say. You have started with, uh, firstly, with your name Zen, and then you went on to become um, a Tibetan Buddhist in the Ramsala, didn't you? And can you very briefly tell us how you have sort of gone through these different Buddhist traditions and how that has enriched your understanding or um, made your understanding of Buddha nature deeper? I think I've been very fortunate to have experience in a number of different Buddhist traditions because in Japan, I didn't really find a teacher um, at that time. You know, I didn't find a monastery for women. And so I traveled on to you know, Southeast Asia and India, but it was too early. That first trip in the 1960s was a bit too early. By the early 1970s, when I reached Dharamsala, then thanks to His Holiness Dalai Lama, there were classes in Buddhism for Western people to study. And there I was fortunate enough to study with some excellent teachers. And I remember very well studying Uttara Tantra with uh, Geshe Ngamang Targe. And he led us to it. I think we studied it several times, Gulama. Mm -hmm. And so this was uh, amazing that I got this opportunity. I, the living conditions in India in those days were very meager, very not, difficult, not easy at all. But um, I remember the only vegetable in the summer was, was the dreaded ladyfinger. <laughs> That's all we could get. But, but we were so determined and we were so fortunate to have like four hours of classes a day um, to study with these brilliant scholars. So I feel very, very fortunate. Yeah, so for the audience, um, uh, Ju Lama, which uh, Venerable has studied uh, way back in 1970s, is Ratnagota Vibhaga, the sublime continuum. And uh, our Buddha Nature uh, website has a very, very detailed uh, translation of the verses, as well as many commentaries there. But uh, Venerable, going back to Buddha Nature, how do you understand it today, having explored so many different traditions? Uh, can you explain your understanding and experience of Buddha nature for the wider audience? Well, uh, to me, I just I define it as you know the potential of all sentient beings to achieve perfect awakening. In other words, all sentient beings can become Buddhas, uh, fully awakened beings, and um, that means all beings right, of all descriptions, of not only human animals, but other animals too. So it's very encompassing. And I know that there are different interpretations of this, even the word, um, you know, the word itself is translated differently. And there are different metaphors that are used to describe it, you know, the embryo of awakening or the, and the, the kernel of awakening, the germ of awakening. Um, I think that womb is a little bit I wouldn't use the word womb because that's more like a container, but the actual germ of awakening itself. Um, and so for me, it's the, the, the potential. And when we go, when we start thinking of it in terms of, um, say, nature, then we start to get a little bit in trouble. <laughs> because especially in China, when they um, say Buddha nature, the, the word nature can be interpreted as something sort of indelible, something, um, something like a substratum of the mm. mind. And then philosophically, I think we veer off course. I, I see it um, simply as the potential. And you know all those great arguments about the acorn and the oak tree, right? So we used to debate those when I got up to the um, Institute of Buddhist Dialectics. And, and the, the whole idea of having the oak tree inside the acorn. I mean, they really do debate these things, you know, <laughs> that it would be similar. And this is how it got misinterpreted maybe in China and Japan that we are Buddhas already. We just don't know it. So we do have to be precise, I think, in our language and understanding of the concept. Mm. 
But there are, of course, uh, also many Tibetan Buddhists who see Buddha nature, or using specifically this term nature, that we have uh, um, uh, as our sort of um, ground, as our sort of inherent uh, um, sort of being, the Buddha nature that is already endowed with all the Buddha qualities. So I think in, even in Tibetan Buddhism, you find both this uh, interpretations. But one thing I came across uh, reading about Buddha nature is also when the Tibetans translated the term Tathagata Garba into Tibetan, and they used uh, Ningpo essence rather than uh, womb, as you said, you didn't personally prefer womb, but somebody thought that that could be more sort of a patriarchal, no, a male oriented translation, not rendering it as room. What do you think? Do you think there would be any such element? No, I don't think so. I mean, that would be arguing backwards because there's nothing patriarchal about Ningbo. This Ningbo is simply heart or center as you like, right? I don't think it's necessarily patriarchal and it avoids the problem of womb as a mm -hmm. container rather than as embryo, as, um, you know, ripe for germination, the Buddha nature that is, has the potential to germinate into full awakening. So I prefer the Deja Ningbo, actually. I okay. think it's <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, Now, um, yes, please. I was just going to say, of course, I'm I'm fully indoctrinated in Chandrakirti's thought. <laughs> I have to say that from the start. So maybe that shows that definitely you're absolutely right that in uh, you know in the Himalayan region there are different um, <coughs> perspectives on this. There are different mm -hmm. views, diametrically opposed views actually on this issue. Different interpretations of Tara Tantra. So yes, but I would probably lean toward the Madhyamika side. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, on that point, before I uh, sort of uh, go into other uh, questions, even Chandrakirti, I found it quite uh, sort of confusing. Well, maybe not confusing, but definitely um, interesting in that Chandrakirti in his Madhyamaka Avatara, no, Madhyamaka Avatara, uh, claims the Buddha nature teachings to be provisional and he doesn't uh, really accept a um, true sort of Buddha nature. Uh, in Saint But then I was quite puzzled that same Chandrakirti, when you look at the Guya Samaja commentary, seemed to accept that there is an absolute nature in us. So maybe even Chandrakirti was quite sort of specific to the context that in the tantric context, would he have accepted an absolute Buddha nature in beings? I, I wouldn't use the word absolute. Mm. We get in trouble if we use the word absolute if we, um, because it might be reified in that way. When mm. it's simply a potential, then we're fine, right? Mm. And nature can be understood in different ways too, right? But if you take nature as a non-affirming negative, you know, mm. uh, the nature of a book is simply to not be not a book, right? It's simply a book, right? But it doesn't assert anything in its place, like something substantial. Then I think we're fine. Mm. Yeah, I think even without using the word absolute, uh, when you look at the issue of whether sentient beings already possess the qualities of the Buddha, Chandrakirti seemed to accept in the tantric context that we are endowed with Buddha qualities. Okay. No? <laughs> yeah, when we get to the tantras, yes, philosophically they're different. I I admit, I agree. Yes, but if, backing up to to Madhyamika and his commentaries on Madhyamika, I think that. It is simply a potential without applying any, in, implying any sort of substratum or essence or self or, you know, core of being. No, nothing. I, I don't think he means to imply that um, before getting into the tantras, right? So, yeah, even words like innate or intrinsic, you know, have, there's a little slippery slope there, you know. <laughs> If we're not careful, we might slip into, because we all want to hold on to ourselves. That's the, you know, it's kind of instinctive um, move is to somehow slip in and hope that there is some kind of um, something to cling to when, in fact, mm -hmm. the Buddha was very clear that there is not, right? Yes, indeed, yes. Um, now, uh, coming back to your own work, um, 
how do you relate this idea of the universal Buddha potential, as you put it, to social justice and feminism? Um, how would you apply them in practice? Well, I think it makes perfect sense. To me, if all beings have this innate potential, or there I used to see I slipped right into it myself, we all have this potential to be fully awakened, then that would include everyone. That would include people of all complexions, all ethnicities, all genders or gender identities or gender or orient sexual orientations. It would include all beings of all descriptions. And therefore it actually uh, makes a perfect grounding for social justice in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, it affirms, it, it confirms that yes, indeed, um, even though our circumstances in life may be different, all of us have that potential. And therefore, mm -hmm. it argues against discrimination on the basis of any of these categories or identity markers, you see. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Not perfect but equality, of course, because equality is a difficult thing to achieve. No, no two beings will be absolutely equal in all respects. Mm -hmm but equal potential we can definitely talk about. Mm. And that's where we run into problems. When mm. we find that there are inequalities, um, even in Buddhist societies, then we have to, I think we have to point it out. It's incompatible yeah. with the Buddhist teachings. Yeah, so that's exactly what uh, I want to ask you. Um, so on the philosophical level, as an ontological concept, we sort of all agree that everyone has the same Buddha potential. But then in social reality, on the ground, uh, even Buddhist societies are highly patriarchal. There's the very serious case of inequality and injustice. What caused that gap? <laughs> Uh, was there a historical explanation? Of course, I think a lot of Buddhist scholars here in Bhutan and also in Tibet would probably blame the Indian cultural baggage that came with the Buddhist teachings. I don't know whether that would be the entire reason. How do you see this gap between the I philosophical think, understanding and the practical reality? Right. I, I think it's too easy to blame it on Indian society. Of course, that was there. But as we know very well, the Buddha was... Uh, kind of radical. He, he radically uh, disavowed that kind of um, social inequality, or at least, you know, his actions spoke against those kinds of social discriminations in that he admitted women, he admitted uh, monks of all backgrounds, even low caste monks. So I would put it down to greed, hatred, and ignorance. Mm. So I mean, why do people discriminate against one another? It's it's greed for power. Those in power want to cling to power. Um, hatred. There is some. There are feelings against against um, you know minorities. Let's let's face it. And mm -hmm. ignorance. I mean, mm -hmm. ignorance. Maybe they haven't had a chance to study the Buddhist text thoroughly or something. But what's most disappointing is that when great scholars who are mm -hmm. familiar with the text discriminate. Mm, how do we justify? How do we understand that? <laughs> But uh, what still puzzles me is um, if this is an issue of universal uh, problems uh, coming from greed, hatred, and ignorance. Um, so all across uh, the globe, we see this patriarchal um, um, sort of control and injustice based on sex. But then we also see quite a lot of matriarchal societies, right? I mean, they didn't certainly have less greed, hatred, or ignorance. So there must have been some element in the cultural evolution as well, which might have influenced is what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, culture influences religion, religion influences culture and uh, society. So it's sort of, it's hard um, to understand completely, you know, chicken and egg kind of situation. Um, for example, let's take an example, you know, the incident where the Buddha hesitated to admit women to the Sangha. Um, and he said, oh, please don't ask, please don't ask, please don't ask three times. Hmm? And what was his rationale? We don't know for sure, but the recent work of um, Bhikkhu Analeo 
seems to indicate that, in fact, he was trying to protect women from assault. Because in those days, leaving the home, you know, leaving the home life, uh, leading the wandering life meant sleeping under trees and, you know, wandering in the forest. And that was definitely dangerous for women. So according to his studies, the Buddha was trying to talk them into living like nuns, but staying at home, mm. right? Shaving their heads, wearing robes, but stay at home and practice in the home. And his stepmother wasn't having it. <laughs> she, mm. she refused to accept that alternative. So um, if this is the case, then, and you know, it, it follows from what he said. He, when Ananda asked him, do women have the potential to achieve the fruits of the path? And he affirmed that they do that they can become liberated. Then we have in the Buddha's own words, and I think that's rare in world religions, that we have the words of the founder affirming the equal potential of women. Mm -hmm. so, so what happens after that, though, is that patriarchy reasserts itself, unfortunately. Even during the Buddha's time, there were incidents where he had to protect the nuns against discrimination and exploitation. So um, why societies fall into those patterns? Um, you know, why does sexism exist? Why do women internalize mm. sexist patterns? This is also a big question for us in the Buddhist women's movement. And how do we unlearn those patterns? Yeah, this is, um, so I think that th this incident where the Buddha hesitated to admit women to the Sangha has been used against women. Oh, see, the Buddha himself wasn't sure that women were deserving, which is not really probably the, the backstory. The backstory is probably more that he cared very much about them and was trying to um, protect them against sexual assault, which happened. We know it happened quite frequently. Uh, but instead, the commentators, you know, one thing is that by um, limiting access to education only to males, you see, if you can keep women ignorant by not allowing them to learn to the sutras, the texts, uh, keep them illiterate if possible, then men have full control of the, of the narrative. They are the, the ones, they are the scholars of the text. They are the interpreters of the text. And there we have potentially have a problem, mm. right? If they can, if they have the, the right and the power to interpret the text according to their own uh, perspective, then what is that? preventing black people from learning to read, for example. Mm. Same story, similar story. So um, going forward uh, then, Venerable, now we have come a long way from the Buddha's days. We are in the 21st century. The social situations are different. So women don't have to have the same sort of uh, kind of, of course, some, but not to the same degree, the, the fear of harassment or assaults or being living a mendicant's life. I think we are in a very different situation in the 21st century. How can we then sort of move forward in terms of bringing greater equality. You have done a lot of work through Sakya Dita and through Jamyang. Can you tell us a bit more about your work and how you hope through that to change this mindset of uh, sexual or gender injustice? Yes, well, you know, I wish that things were that much better than before, but I'm not sure they really are. If one in eight women in the United States has been sexually assaulted, then that means that, you know, we don't have statistics from the time of the Buddha, but that's, that's really an unacceptable percentage. It means even today, even with modern education and roughly equal educational opportunities, and even with laws that are supposed to protect people from assault, it continues. Um, also, at the time of the Buddha, women did have access to full ordination. Now in many Buddhist countries, women do not have access to full ordination, including the Tibetan tradition. You have uh, some bhikkhunis in Bhutan and congratulations for that. Um, there are a few in India as well, but in general, 
officially there is no bhikkhuni sangha in the Tibetan tradition or in Thailand or Laos or Cambodia or even Sri Lanka where more than half the nuns are fully ordained but they're still not officially recognized. They cannot use their, their bhikkhuni names on their passports, for example. They cannot get you know, government stipends for education. So there's still massive inequalities, even in Buddhist societies today. How do we change that? Well, I'm convinced it's through education, that um, by educating women, we give them confidence as well as knowledge. And this will help to empower women to recognize unjust patterns in society and give them the tools to work to correct those injustices. This is my hope. And this is what we've been trying to do um, through Sakyadita and Jamyang Foundation. So Sakyadita is the International Association of Buddhist Women. Sakyadita meaning Daughters of the Buddha. We started in 1987. We meet every two years around the, in some country around the world, usually in a Buddhist country in Asia, and bring women together from all different Buddhist traditions to uh, learn from each other and encourage each other. And since, you know, women in China, Korea, uh, Taiwan, and Vietnam, unfortunately not Japan, do have access to full ordination. And they also have access to e roughly equal educational opportunities, including Buddhist education. See, these things seem to go hand in hand. In addition, they seem to have roughly equal, not completely, but roughly equal support from the lay community. So where you have full ordination for women, you also have greater equality in terms of educational opportunities, and you have roughly equal support from the lay community. So they seem, there seems to be a correlation among these three. In societies where you have no a full ordination for women, where women are perpetually novices, are usually ordained by men, monks, males, um, who that you know they can't normally don't live in the same monasteries, um, don't usually have equal educational opportunities, um, usually don't have nearly equal um, support from the lay community, then they're perpetually disadvantaged. So it's, we've been working mostly on the education front. So Jamyang Foundation was an effort to try to provide equal education opportunities for women, um, especially for nuns, because these are the women who are dedicated full time to studying Dharma. But we welcome lay women, but usually only a few will come. So by improving the educational standards for women, in the last 30 years, we've seen fantastic changes, monumental changes, and even the uh, Geshe degree awarded to um, quite a few nuns, and it's ongoing. So this is really good. Not that the Geshe degree is the only way to learn Buddhism, but the, the study program is very systematic, and it really has changed things for women to prove, first of all, to prove that not only are women interested in philosophy, but they can be really good at it. So this has been a complete transformation in terms of people's perceptions of women and their capabilities. Yeah, I mean, I fully understand how education is vital for um, female empowerment or empowerment of anybody. Um, but um, the focus you have, especially through Sakya Dita, seem to be so much on celibate monastic communities, or at least uh, helping nuns have the same degree of uh, power and education. In, uh, I can't remember which book, but one of your book, you mentioned um, that monastic life is a crucible for uh, you know, uh, part to enlightenment and not necessarily the panacea for problems. Uh, you have become a nun in 1977 uh, and become a bhikshuni in uh, when was it, uh, 1982. Um, in my case, I would say I've been a monk. Uh, most of the audience may not know that uh, for a good 12 years, I have uh, finished my monastic training and was also teaching in a monastery. And uh, I was getting caught up in a kind of a superficial world. This will probably underscore also your issue that in the monastic world, 
the female monastics are far lesser than the male. I mean, so I was leading a nunnery also, being pampered by the nuns. <laughs> there was quite a lot of sort of worldly uh, pampering that distracted me from the actual spiritual growth. So it was not the right crucible for me. <laughs> it didn't really help me. Instead, coming back to the lay life, the ordinary lay life where you have lots of trials and tribulations to face, helped me grow spiritually. So. In our age, do you think monastic life is still the best sort of most conducive state to be in for bringing out our Buddha nature or you think even being living a lay spiritual life is as good? Well, for one thing, nuns don't have to worry about being pampered because nobody is pampering us. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> but I think it's very personal. It's very individual. And it's also uh, different from one society to the next. For example, the way monks are treated in Thailand is not necessarily the same way that monks are treated in, in the Tibetan tradition in India. You know, where, I mean, monks, monks in, in Tibet, monks in Bhutan and India, they all know how to cook, yeah? Whereas monks in Thailand, are, they're always being served. So it's quite a different experience. Uh, for for monks in in these different traditions, um, of course, even as a monk or a nun, we also have to face our own mind. Just being in a monastery doesn't cure everything, not at all. We still bring all of our uh, mental defilements with us when we get our dangers. Maybe our ideals are higher. Um, the advantages are that we have more time without family obligations. We have more time to study and practice, so that's a plus. Um, it doesn't mean that everything is taken care of, certainly not for nuns. We still have to find our own food. We have to cook our food. We have to clean up. We have to, you know, we have to do all of it. But still, um, there's, it is a bit easier in that we don't get called out to social events. I mean, we can easily say no to social entanglements and family obligations. So that's a plus. And uh, we don't get emotionally entangled in romantic relationships, which cons consumes enormous energy, mm -hmm. I, I believe, right? And so there are clearly some, some advantages to the monastic life, but certainly it's not completely necessary. It's, it's really mm -hmm. possible to practice as a lay person. As we all know, some uh, lay practitioners are much better practitioners than some monastics. Just being in robes does not guarantee anything. In fact, there are quite a lot of charlatans, and I, I don't say this to disrespect anyone, but it's making the newspapers, so what can I tell you? <laughs> um, it, we, we, um, whatever role we take, then we need to do our, you know, try our best. But of course, one advantage to the monastic system as it operated in traditional societies was that the monastics got, and they were mostly male, got a, a good education in Buddhist studies. And therefore, they became the keepers of the tradition. Uh, they were able to, to teach. They were able to counsel the lay people according to the Dharma. And this is a tremendous gift society that you have certain religious specialists who know the text and that can interpret the text for everyday life. That's an amazing skill and very important. That's why Buddhism has... Um, maintained itself over two and a half millennia, because you have this monastic institution. Uh, and institutions have their problems. Yes, we all know that. But the, the advantage is that they've been able to maintain certain standards of uh, behavior, certain um, uh, texts and, and intellectual traditions and certain practices that might have gotten lost or maybe transformed beyond recognition. So now we come to modern day life and Buddhism in North America and Europe. And we look at the ways it's changing where the um, majority of teachers are now pretty much lay teachers. And then we need to look at it and see you know, what, how these changes are going to play out in society. Uh, yes, in some ways, it's very positive what we see. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a new emphasis on meditation, for example, which I think is very healthy. And um, also a big emphasis on social engagement. 
where Buddhists are not afraid to take to the streets and teach in the prisons, you know, um, and demonstrate for prison reform and all of this, you know, we can, um, we can do those things in, in the United States and, and increasingly in Asia too. So it's not really an East-West thing, maybe it's more a generational thing uh, because lay meditation practice is now huge in Asia everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, even in China, it's becoming popular. So it's really a bit difficult to make predictions or assumptions about um, Buddhism in the modern day. There are a lot of positive things happening. There. And there is not a lot of support for monasticism in the West. There are very few monasteries in North America or Europe. Um, where where uh, some a monk or a nun can live, you know, without having to attend to, you know, other responsibilities. Now it's not many, just a few. So so what will happen if we don't have a generation of trained specialists in Buddhism? Where sometimes people are sort of crafting the Dharma according to their the needs of the society. Hmm, how is this going to work out? <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. I think uh, before I turn to the next topic that I want to um, ask you, uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, if Marcus has received any question. Uh, there is one question about going back to the philosophy. It sounds like someone would like to debate a little bit. <laughs> Uh, it says, Anila, what do you think of the Uttara Tantra images of Buddha nature being like pure gold buried in a rough piece of ore and other such images if Buddha nature is not primary to fundamental being to begin with? Mm. Well, I think all of these images are useful where you have the image of the, you know, the embryo, the jewel, the pure gold or yes i agree that buddha nature is like all of those things uh, to be like something is not to be something it's to be similar to right so the buddha nature is like pure gold or the true nature of the mind is we could say luminous it's clear knowing right clear knowing and awareness so this we can see clear knowing as luminous because it's unobscured it's undefiled by mental afflictions so i don't see a contradiction there but open to the um a lot of these uh, examples or these metaphors used in the sutras as well as the ratnagotra vibhaga they sort of imply that we have latent in us the Buddha qualities, isn't it? Not that Buddha qualities are not newly generated or cultivated. So uh, sometimes you wonder, because there are two analogies you find, like you know, the seed analogy from which the tree grows, but all, at the same time, the statue buried in the ground or the gold buried in the ground or the universal monarch in a womb and so forth. A lot of these examples do sort of give a, a difficult <laughs> um, suggestion that there, there is a sort of a latent qualities of the Buddha in us. Um, but you would not agree to that. <laughs> I would say, you know, a metaphor, it's like the finger pointing to the moon. These metaphors are useful for giving us the idea of how how potent this potential is. It's, it's potent mm -hmm. like, um, like pure gold. But it's not pure gold itself. If we were already Buddhists and just don't know it, which is what happens in East Asia, they actually start to talk in these terms. We're already Buddha already, but we just don't know it. As soon as we wake up and realize that we're a Buddha already, a Buddha already, then we will be, you know, Buddha, we're home free. However, we can easily recognize the flaw in that logic, because if we were Buddhists already, we wouldn't do the things that we do. We wouldn't act the way that we act. 
our minds would be perfectly pure. We would not have any stains of greed, hatred, and ignorance, pride, jealousy, and all the rest of it, right? We'd be perfectly pure. No mm -hmm. discrimination of, you know, worldly things, no interest in worldly things at all. But we do, right? So we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. well, which I think proves that we're not a Buddha yet. We're potentially a Buddha. But we've got work to do. You know, even from the time we become a bodhisattva, we still have three countless eons to becoming a Buddha. We have to accumulate merit and wisdom for three countless eons. I mean, that's uh, we've got plenty of work on our plate. So um, if someone's already a Buddha, I'd, good on them. You know, I'm very happy to hear that. But I don't think <laughs> I don't think it's very common. Not from what but, we see. But, uh, if I may. I mean, it's not just only East Asian Buddhists. Is it? There are lots of these sutras that are embraced by the, um, the Tibetan Buddhists as well, which uses metaphors. And again, to take this point a little further, one of the metaphors you find is also the roaming prince, you know, which I compare to the prodigal son. In the, way. <laughs> the prince, unaware that he is a prince, while roaming in the, the ordinary world with lot of uh, problems is still the prince it's matter of not knowing it it I mean when you know that you're a prince then you know, it doesn't it, it's not about getting a new identity as I so a lot of the um, people who advocate that we have the Buddha qualities in us we are already Buddhas by nature would argue it's just the obscurations the adventitious afflictions that um, make us do the things that you mentioned we are doing and not realize our nature. I mean, especially the prince um, metaphor, how do you read that? How would you understand it if Buddha nature is only a potential? Well, you can see that the mind itself, the consciousness itself, and being clear knowing awareness is not different in quality from the clear knowing awareness of a Buddha. Both are empty by nature. Right? So what's different is that the adventitious stains mm. on the awareness, you know, all of that. They, they liken it to the clouds in the clear blue sky or the waves in the mm. clear blue ocean, you know, that the stains, the clouds are not part of the sky, they come and go. Similarly, the mental defilements come and go, but are not part of the intrinsic nature of, of consciousness. Consciousness as clear, pure knowing, I agree, is not that different. So the prodigal son, or as you as you will, whatever, <laughs> is, is not that different. But uh, however, as long as those stains are on the consciousness, it's not a Buddha yet. By definition, a Buddha's awareness is completely free from all stains and the seeds of all the violence as well. So there would be a difference. Otherwise, that sun would not have been wandering. The sun would have been a Buddha, right? Mm. Once the stains are removed, then we can say a person is fully aware. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you. So, Marcus, can we have another question? Or yes, we have... have another question now. Uh, Venerable, in your opinion, what do you think the most difficulty in the Tibetan tradition is in terms of embracing, uh, sorry, it's hard to read this, uh, embracing the nun to be fully ordination. I guess they're, they're asking what's the difficulty in the Tibetan tradition to accept mm -hmm. nuns as being fully ordained, uh, having full ordination and um, either in terms of the monastics or the lay society as well in the Tibetan tradition. Um, that's, yeah, that's basically the question. I think the biggest obstacle is sexism. Mm -hmm. really. That um, there is no reason that women should not be fully ordained. The, the precepts for the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis are not that different. In fact, the, the nuns have more, fully ordained nuns have you know, 70 plus more precepts than the monks. And they're not that different in nature, the precepts. Um, it would mean some changes in Tibetan society to give full recognition, 
full authority to the nuns. All the institutions would have to change. All the institutions are completely male dominated. Women have no voice at all in, in Tibetan Buddhist institutions, in the government or in the leading monasteries. They're not even allowed in. So, I mean, this is not a, a criticism, it's just a fact. And so if women were to be fully ordained, there should be no barrier to them taking positions within the government, within the leading monastic orders. But one thing is that men would need to learn to share power. And that's a learned skill. People in power do not give up power lightly, as we see in our own government, you know, in the United States government. They'll do anything to cling to power. So there's a basic conservatism based on patriarchal traditions that is meaning that there needs to be a complete reset of values um, that would open up the society to women's leadership. Now, there are women leaders in Tibetan society, uh, but usually they are related to highly placed males so far, with some exceptions. You know, there have been some tulpus, some women tulpus recognized also, but in many cases, they were the relatives of highly placed males. So I think that um, gender training is the, is the key. Gender training such as uh, is received by all people working in the United Nations and almost all non-governmental organizations. People routinely receive gender training to unlearn some of these sexist habits yeah. that we all, we all carry because of our conditioning. Mm -hmm. And it takes time to unlearn them. We need the skills. We need to practice the skills of unlearning, just like we need to unlearn racism. We also need to unlearn sexism. And that takes training and takes a will, the political will that um, Carmel Pinsola was mentioning earlier uh, we need the political will to actually change society and make it egalitarian. So it's a, it's also, a social justice issue. Mm -hmm. But venerable, one of the things I uh, personally observe is also that the Buddhist world and even the Tibetan Buddhist world is a very decentralized system. No one has a sort of full absolute authority to make things different or change things. So even His Holiness the Dalai Lama in spite of his full support for Bhikshuni ordination, he's not the supreme head of all the Buddhist traditions. So it almost seems to me that these changes have to come from the grounds up. And if you just do it, if Bhutanese nuns go for the full Bhikshuni ordination, there'll probably be no one who will stop you. But then there wouldn't be anyone who will sort of formally allow these things to happen either. What is your experience? Well, you know, my experience is that I had permission from His Holiness Dalai Lama and several other of my teachers uh, to receive full ordination. They couldn't give it to me themselves because they don't have the lineage, mm. but they gave me permission to go and get it wherever I could find it, as long as I could keep the precepts was their only caveat. <laughs> so I went to Korea. And then after getting ordination there, I went through the ordination process again in Taiwan to see how they organized it because we wanted to bring it into the Tibetan tradition. And since that time, I also helped um, eight, well, six nuns from Tilopur to go to Hong Kong to receive the ordination. I took them, I mean, we went to see His Holiness Dalai Lama. He gave them his full blessing. And when we got when they got back, we went to see him again, and he congratulated them and gave them each a Buddha image. And he has also since that time said publicly a number of times that we who are practicing as bhikkhunis in the Tibetan tradition are bhikkhunis, and we are all also fully within the Tibetan tradition. So we are bhikkhunis practicing in the Tibetan tradition. However, we still do not have official recognition. Then he has said, official recognition is not so important. He would like to see there be a bhikshuni sangha in the Tibetan tradition, but he has not been able to convince the senior bhikshus of his own tradition to accept it. He told us this personally in Hamburg um, in 2007 when we had this 
um, conference. He has not been able to convince them yet. So he said, just go and take it. Now, the problem is that the nuns in the Tibetan tradition, the Himalayan nuns, Tibetan nuns, Bhutanese, and so forth, who are studying in India and Nepal, are waiting for him to give it. They want to receive it from him personally. They want to receive it from their teachers. And, the, and to go to Taiwan, they're welcome to go to Taiwan anytime and get it, or Hong Kong. They'll even pay their, you know, their expenses will be covered. But no, they want to get it from their own teachers. And mm. so they're waiting. And this is the impasse. This is where mm. we, they'd love to get it. Most of them would love to get full ordination, but they want to get it from within their own tradition, mm. from their own teachers. That's mm. where we stand at the moment. Thank you. Marcus, another question? Or shall we? Uh, there's a uh, more general question just about um, with a, a world so filled with injustice and suffering and dehumanization, uh, how can we try to save beings when so many are closed off and afraid? These days with so many difficulties, people are even naturally suspicious of kindness and generosity, what to do? Uh, be kind anyway. <laughs> yeah, Mother Teresa said that, that's not original, but you know, um, we need to be as kind as we possibly can, as compassionate as we possibly can in thought, words, and actions. And maybe everyone is not ready to accept it, but it will help the society. I see it. Um, I see it here in Hawaii. People are going out of their way to be kind. And it's really making a huge difference for how people are able to accept the hardships of the pandemic. Yeah, so I think more than ever, we're called to be kind and compassionate, uh, caring individuals, and it will definitely have a major impact on society. So I think the Buddhist teachings are more relevant than ever before, because how do we develop compassion in our hearts? Where's the instruction booklet? It's right in the sutras, you know, it's right in the Buddhist text, exactly, step by step, all the meditations, it's spelled out clearly from A to Z how to do it. You know, other religious traditions, everyone wants to be loving and kind, and compassionate and all that, but how to do it? The Buddhists really have the technologies for doing it. So we have something very important to share, whether we're a scholar or a practitioner, whether we're ordained or lay, it's irrelevant. Um, in that, we all can spread loving kindness and compassion, and it will have a huge positive impact on society and help people in whatever ways we can. We need to get more skillful. How do we deal with people with depression? We need to develop those skills, but the basic um, teachings are there. We can, we can use them. We can put them into practice. Hmm. Okay, Marcus, I think we have a couple more questions. Shall we take them very quickly before we end the conversation? Sure. Uh, one question is, uh, who, who do the nuns actually get ordination from in Taiwan or Hong Kong that, that you mentioned? Well, there are many opportunities. The, before it was nationalized, it was uh, an annual ordination of uh, nuns from all monasteries. Most of them had already undergone uh, at least a few years of training as novices, and then they would get together at one monastery uh, with usually 600 or 1,000 people at one time and get ordained. But for the last um, 10 years or more, there have also been ordinations at different monasteries, not so huge. And so it's been, become more decentralized. But they are then um, authorized by the, the Buddhist Association in Taiwan to do that. So um, in Korea, too. Korea, it's a little more difficult because of the language and because they require six years of intensive training and they'd like people to get that training in Korea. Uh, Taiwan and, and Hong Kong is, is much easier. Um, so it differs from place to place. Some, some nuns have even gotten ordained in Los Angeles. I attended one ordination in 1988 in Los Angeles. There was another big one in Bodh Gaya in 1998, which I also witnessed there was another one in 96 in Sarnath 
that I also witnessed. And so ordinations are happening here and there. Um, but the ordaining um, masters, as they call them, ordination masters, acharyas, are Taiwanese, generally speaking, Chi Taiwanese. Sometimes they've invited um, monastics from China. In, in Los Angeles, there are a few monks from China, highly placed monastics. Um, so that's, that's the general idea. But it could, in theory, it could be any. What happens is that usually they want to go to the most, um, you know, highly realized mm. monastics they can find, the highest placed. You know, like, for example, I was ordained, my novice ordination is from Gala Karmapa, the 16th. And, and the 16th Karmapa was something very special. You just meet him and look at him. You want to be a monk or a nun. <laughs> he ordained thousands of monks and nuns because... I don't know, it's just something very special. So, mm. but technically it could be any 10 um, bhikkhus and 10 bhikkhunis together could organize an ordination. Okay. I think there's a general question about how we can further education and learning of Buddha nature, which uh, I suppose so we can say that there are many trainings and uh, teachings being given by uh, lamas and masters, but our buddhanature.org resource is itself a very good place to begin. And then I see a, a question, comment from a dear friend of mine who is uh, I think in California right now, who says he wants to stir the pot by saying that you know, the Bhikshuni ordination itself is sort of sexist. When you look at the, the, the precepts you have to follow. So wouldn't it be better to promote upasakas and upasikas than having more nuns who will have to follow the sexist with their rules? What's your take on that, Anila? Uh, venerable. Um, I don't think that the Vinaya is sexist per se. What you're probably referring to are the six special rules, or the eight guru dharmas. And, um, and eight guru dharmas, yes. And they are not found in the Vinaya. They are mm -hmm. extra canonical. So the story goes that the Buddha finally relented, right? As if he needed to be convinced he's an awakened being, but they say that he was finally convinced to ordain his stepmother as a, as a bhikkhuni, as long as she followed these eight special rules, which are clearly discriminatory against women. At least, you know, it makes ordination much more difficult for women. And women, uh, nuns have to bow to monks, even if they're only newly ordained today, and so forth. The actual precepts of the bhikshuni are not um, that different. And the ones that are different are almost are, are pretty clearly for the protection of the nuns. So I don't see that as discriminatory. The eight guru dharmas are, uh, are definitely discriminatory, at least four of them. And, um, and yet, we don't know for sure that the Buddha spoke them. Mm -hmm. Because how could he, um, for example, one of them is that nuns need to be ordained by 10 bhikkhus and 10 bhikkhunis. But how could he possibly have said that? Because there were no bhikkhunis yet. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, <laughs> how could he say that nuns have to be um, absolved of um, transgressions by 20 bhikshus, uh, 10, 20 bhikshus and 20 bhikshunis when there were no bhikshunis yet. It's suspicious. Mm. It's almost certain that these were not spoken by the Buddha. But that's another one of the narratives that have contributed to gender inequities in Buddhist societies. The idea that because women have more precepts, there's something morally um, wrong with them you know that they have they have to be reined in by more precepts but that wasn't the point really um these were no doubt imposed by monks mm. Oh, mm. To, so to consolidate their position of authority in the sangha yeah well that's very refreshing i think uh, this new research that the eight guru dharmas might have been instituted by monks much later <laughs> and not by the buddha himself um, Marcus, do you have other questions that I don't see, or sh should I resume the conversation? Uh, you can please resume, yeah. That's Thank most you. Of the questions. Um, yeah. 
Yes, I think I'm going to stretch the conversation by another five to 10 minutes. It's uh, such a great uh, opportunity to have uh, Venerable Lakshela with us. So the second topic that I wanted to ask you about is um, your work on death. I mean, you have uh, yourself experienced serious illness while in the Ramsala uh, and also been bitten by uh, a snake, uh, so almost sort of near death experience you have had yourself, plus loss of dear ones. And when you look at, and then you have written about death and dying. Um, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition of dealing with death and using it as an opportunity to bring out the inner Buddha nature, you, know, you have these concepts of clear light practice and all the bardo, the intermediate state teachings and uh, meditation practices. How do you see this as being sort of relevant to the contemporary society, uh, a secular Western society, particularly say the people of United States? Is it relevant? How um, can this be made useful for the people? I think the teachings on death and impermanence in the Buddhist tradition are extremely relevant, especially now. Um, Western societies in general have been in the throes of death denial for a long time. Even the idea of embalming the bodies and, you know, open casket funerals as if, you know, they're going to be looking the same way they've looked for their whole life, or looking their best, actually. It's a kind of a death mm -hmm. denial. And, what happens is that when someone, uh, someone's relatives, their loved ones die, people suffer a lot because they're not really prepared for this loss, um, much less when they themselves get a terminal diagnosis. They're unprepared for the realities of death and impermanence. So the Buddhist teachings are extremely helpful uh, for so many reasons, you know, learning to train the mind um, helps us to navigate the process of dying. Now, even if we don't accept rebirth, even if we don't accept this concept of an intermediate state between this lifetime and the next called the bardo, even so, by having a mind that is well-trained, it will help us to face death and to negotiate uh, the process of losing everything. We lose not only our possessions, lose our friends, lose our families, but even have to lose our own identity at the time yeah. of death. So to prepare for that, the Buddhist teachings are very, very relevant, very important, very useful, because they deconstruct the, the human person into these five aggregates, the body, the feelings, the perceptions, the mental formations, and consciousness, to see that the I that we're so attached to is really a construct. It's a label. It's a convenient fiction that we give to these disparate elements, these constituents of the person. It's just, you know, we say karma punso because it's easier to distinguish on the everyday level one person from another. But ultimately, when we go to look for karma punso, what do we find? We take apart all of your elements and so forth, all your aggregates, we, we cannot find something solid, tangible, enduring. Now, understanding that is really important because it prepares us for the moment of death. We're not expecting to endure. We know that we're going to decompose. We're going to deconstruct, dissolve, basically, at the time of death. Now, if we understand the or accept the theory of rebirth, right, then it's also immensely helpful because we learn the stages of the dying process. And here, the Tibetan tradition really has... Um, tremendous resources for helping us through this process. It actually teaches us meditations on how to recognize the stages of the dying process. When the form aggregate dissolves, what will we see? What will we experience? When the feelings aggregate dissolves, what will we experience? What will we see? It, how will we feel? You know, it's all right there in the text. We can practice it in advance so it won't come as such a shock when the time comes. Then it deconstructs the, the dissolution of the mind, the, the, the you know, 60 mental factors and so forth. And ultimately um, helps us to travel through the intermediate stage 
um, also especially to recognize the clear light of depth as the true nature of our own mind. We talked about the Selshin Rikpa, this clear mm -hmm. knowing awareness. There will come a point in the dissolution of the mind when this true nature of the mind will make itself visible. And it's, a, it's like a, a blinding light. It's so powerful to see the true nature of one's own mind. If we've practiced well, we'll recognize it. You know, ah, there we go. The texts were right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we can just follow through from there. If we're not prepared, we'll see this blinding light and probably just pass out, maybe even be afraid. But if we recognize that it's the true nature of our mind, the true empty nature of our mind, nothing to be attached to, nothing to be afraid of. Then we can continue on. If we're a bodhisattva, we can even choose our next, um, the circumstances of our next rebirth. This might be worth working for. Yeah, I bring this up partly because uh, you, know, you mentioned the denial of death in the uh, Western societies, not even sort of willing and daring to discuss it. But also, when you look at the global demography, especially in developed countries like uh, Europe and East Asia, places like Japan, and also North America, to some extent, I suppose, the population is aging. There's a huge aging population who will need a lot of um, uh, palliative care, terminal care. Okay? And um, when you look at societies here in the Himalayas, I think we put in so much resources for that sort of last minute care. Sometimes even overdo it <laughs> with so many rituals. And mm -hmm. I was thinking how we can bring this sort of old practices as kind of a psychotherapeutic uh, sort of uh, help for people who are nearing the end of their life in Western secular societies. Yeah, I've heard that funerals in Bhutan are extremely expensive. People will Indeed. go bankrupt with um, you know, funding these rituals. And I don't know that rituals are really helpful for the, for the dying person so much as for the family. Um, I think that funerals and so forth um, are helpful for the survivors to help them to come to terms with their loss. But what's really going to help us in the, our future um, is the good deeds that we've accumulated in this lifetime how well we've trained our mind, how compassionate we've been, how generous we've been. This is what will really be of, of help. Um, rituals by other people, it's a debate about how, whether and to what extent it's possible to transfer merit from one person to another. I mean, if our consciousnesses are individuated, which they are, right, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, we each of us has our own stream of consciousness that continues or appears to continue from life to life time actually it's impermanent then how can the rituals that you do actually benefit me and vice versa it's um it's a, a bit of a debate then some say oh well they share one economy they eat out of a common pot therefore what the good deeds that one does will benefit everyone who shares in that you know, families' resources. This is the theory. But ultimately, the most important thing beyond rituals is how well we've practiced, how well we've trained our minds while we're alive. Yeah. Mm. Yes, indeed. So uh, with that, I think uh, we'll end the session. Um, I want to read out something from your uh, book eminent Buddhist women, where you write, um, this Buddhist feminist revolution is concerned with optimizing the precious human opportunity, a widespread awakening that's transplanting itself deeply into the hearts of millions of women around the world today. I thought I uh, should add, or the Sadra Foundation uh, would like to add, that the Buddhist feminist revolution is also concerned with actualizing the inner Buddha nature. And similarly, that this Buddha nature initiative is a precious way of awakening the inner capacity to flourish in the hearts of millions of uh, women around the world. So with that, uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Venerable Lexila. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you virtually. <laughs> I, I hope we will someday be able to converse uh, in person uh, when all this uh, COVID pandemic is over. And I hope the audience all around the world has also enjoyed the conversation. Um, so with that, uh, Good morning, good afternoon, evening or night, depending on wherever you are. <laughs> Tashidelek, uh, malaho, aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you so much.